Right. Um, I thought I'd um, interrupt this session about how we deal with, with museums and such with um, a look at, well, a history that hopefully most of us already know about how our archives appear in the first place. Um, and hopefully some of you, at least in the audience, will have experienced most of this firsthand. All right, and I, I'm an archeologist with Historic England. I've been with them for about three decades now, on and off. And um, for my sins, I am now um, supposed to be looking at digital strategy for excavation archives as, as, a, as a job. Now, uh, which button makes this go? Right hand, okay, right. Okay, well, we all know the, the history of archives um, from the antiquarians who gave us the odd notebook, some interesting finds, and the odd box of other bits they might have thought were worth keeping, um, whilst discarding most of the rest of the physical stuff that they destroy on site. Um, I'm reading Alice Roberts' Ancestry book at the moment, where she uh, mentions about Pitt Rivers digging up a hundred skeletons and only keeping the skulls as part of his collection. <laughs> um, of course, in the tail end of the 20th century, we got a bit more scientific about everything. We invented recording systems, actual paper manuals to explain how to capture data, lots of pro formas, and now instead of your archive just being the interesting contexts that get jotted down in the site director's notebook, now every context is getting a record and we're generating reams of paper uh, in the pre-digital age to record the same stuff. Um, whether or not it's all on acid-free paper, I wouldn't want to venture. Um, but in addition to actually capturing the, the, the paper record, um, we also collect most of the stuff that we find on site. So we're not discarding anymore in the, in the way that um, used to happen. And this is um, our workspace down at Fort Cumberland, the laying out shed for those who've been. Um, there's several projects on the table, but the idea is that um, your typical site goes from a small collection to now dozens and dozens of boxes of material that have to eventually find a home somewhere in a museum. Um, and that was okay in the days when people first started getting scientific about recording the stuff that we destroy through excavation and creating this preservation by record business so that people in the future might be able to reinterpret our interpretations of sites. Um, unfortunately though, PPG 16 came along in 1990 and suddenly every construction site in the country was potentially an excavation, all generating archives like that, all of which had to go somewhere. And for most of my professional career, I've heard all sorts of rumors and whispers about storage issues in the sector, um, which are only going to get worse because we keep digging more stuff up. And we've heard this morning about Northamptonshire and uh, uh, yeah, a new sort of archive center. And I know there are plans afoot that will be discussed this afternoon um, about doing something similar for um, the rest of the country. Um, but it's, it's a known issue. Um, and of course, you know, we've gone from uh, the usual storage of, of archaeological archives to something a bit more professional, hopefully. Um, this again is Fort Cumberland, um, which is nice and neat and um, easily accessible and well-preserved, climate controlled, et cetera, et cetera. Um, unfortunately, there's still a lot of material that's in the hands of either the organizations that dug it or uh, local societies, et cetera, um, in all sorts of variable conditions. Um, so uh, that is something I know that is, is in hand. But it's only half the, the story, um, because in the early 1980s, these things became available to us. And no sooner did we have computers than we started writing databases and things for them and typing in all of our paper records and playing with them in various formats. Um, the difficulty with that, of course, is that all of those recording systems we invented a few decades earlier were all unique because none of us wanted to use everyone else's system. So they're, they're, they're similar and they're capturing the same stuff, but in slightly different ways. And computers don't cope very well with that. Um, so we have an issue there. Um, and of course, as soon as we had somewhere to put digital files, we had digital cameras appear. And there's a bit of an arms race with digital cameras. The file sizes get bigger with every generation. Um, and it also means that instead of having to think carefully about those 36 slides on your wet film and generating an archive of several hundred photos for a site, now you can generate several thousand at the click of a button because electrons are cheap. Um, and in addition to the normal volume of site photography that has increased, lately um, we've started increasing 
by doing things like structure from motion or photogrammetry as it used to be called. Now that the software is easily available and runnable on a decent sized laptop, um, and each structure from motion model, you may have to capture another 100 photos and add them to your archive, um, all at sort of you know, highest quality TIFF, et cetera. And we recently had a project in Rutland where we partnered with a, a, a local commercial unit and their modus operandi for day-to-day -day work, rather than drawing plans and sections and spending the time on site, is to shorten the, the site time and make it more productive by doing structure from motion and creating large volumes of photography that has to go somewhere. Um, and it's not just the photography side of things. I mean, geophysics generates lots of, lots of data. Um, laser scanning came along 20 years ago and created us huge volumes of data. And of course, now that we have drone technology, we can hoist all of these systems up in the air to get an, a unique view of our sites, which is great from a, an understanding standpoint, but generates yet another layer of digital data. So um, there's an obvious issue as to what we do with that stuff. Now, in the bad old days of just a database, it would go on something like this. Um, hands up if you have a device that still has a hole that will take any of these media. Um, and these would then wind up in a box, usually with the paper records, in the basement of a museum, where very soon they became obsolete and unreadable. Um, and it's, it's a bit of a problem. And of course, a lot of organizations now that are generating data are still holding on to their data for one reason or another. Um, but if you go to the Core Trust Seal website, there is one champion organization in the UK to take digital excavation data. And it's our friends at the ADS. Um, and they, they promise to maintain our data in perpetuity, to migrate it through various systems, make it available to anyone. It's a wonderful thing, but of course that costs money and that acts as a barrier to deposition, especially for small organizations um, who can't afford necessarily to pay large amounts to have their data kept forever. Um, and of course, larger organizations have the, the disincentive that their data, well, it, it's commercially sensitive. It, it allows, um, them to essentially outcompete their competitors. So if we come to our FAIR principles, and I'll wrap up in a moment, um, findable. If we're not depositing the data in the first place, it's not as findable as it should be. And this is a major problem. And keeping it simply in, in an in-house system with a pointer on Oasis is, is a limited fix to that, really. We have to hope that the units that hold this data stay in business for a start, don't have any major technological failures for whatever reason, um, and are willing to let you see it. Um, accessibility, again, what are we archiving? Um, we've taken the, the, the decision that our database that we use at the moment has to be ripped down into its core components of CSV tables and such in order to deposit it, plus a stack of metadata so people can rebuild it in whatever system exists in the future. Um, but if data is in some other system on, in, in some other company, do you need the software to be able to open it in the first place? And therefore, is it accessible? And then there's the interoperability. Um, at last year's CIFA, I attended a session that Jay Carver was speaking at, um, dealing with HS2, and he said that while all the geophysical data came in, in a standard format, which was great for interoperability, um, the excavation data from, I forget how many individual units were involved in creating data on that, all came in their own formats and therefore took a huge amount of data cleaning just to be able to do anything with it. So if we're creating the same data, but in different styles that don't actually speak to each other, it affects the reusability because you can't, well, we're burdening future researchers with having to do all this data cleaning because we aren't depositing stuff in a standard format. And something that, that my role will incorporate is actually speaking to various people who are creating digital data and looking at whether or not we can come up with a, a standard excavation data format so as to at least make our data more usable for people in, in the, the future. Um, so my two pleas are we need to deposit more and we need to standardize. All right, thank you.